Welcome everyone to our ISDN session 2021. Um, this session is called What Should Higher Education Institutions Be Doing to Advance Sustainability Research? This session is hosted by both the Sustainability Research Initiative and the Network for Transdisciplinary Research, TDNet, of the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences. My name is Gabriela Wülser. I'm the head of the Sustainability Research Initiative, and I will be the moderator of this session. Um, my expertise is in sustainability science and transdisciplinarity, and I'm an environmental scientist by training and hold a doctorate from the ETH Zurich. The session will be composed of two parts. The first part consists of an introductory input, um, and the second and main part will be dedicated to an interactive exchange with our participants, all of you. Um, before we start, I would like to introduce you to my co-conveners, who will also give the introductory talk. On the one hand, this is Peter Edwards. Peter Edwards is a pro was professor of plant ecology at ETH Zurich, chair of the Department of Environmental System Science and subsequently director of the Singapore ETH Center for Global Environmental Sustainability. He was also a member of the executive board of the Alliance for Global Sustainability, a research partnership of several universities. He currently chairs the Sustainability Research Initiative of the Swiss Academy of Sciences, Estenat. On the other hand, this is uh, Teres Paulsen. Teres Paulsen is head of the Network for Transdisciplinary Research, TDNet, of the Swiss Academies. She's a professional in knowledge exchange and transfer and a co-educator in the first MOOC on transdisciplinarity. Her master's degree in environmental sciences from ETH Zurich has given her an understanding of the importance of intra and transdisciplinary approaches, especially for tackling societal challenges. With this brief introduction of who we are, I would like to hand over to Peter to start our introduction. Peter, we cannot hear you. Thank you, Gabriella, and, and welcome from my side. How can a nation, in our case, we're talking about Switzerland, meet its commitments to the SDGs by 2030? How can Switzerland reach zero carbon by 2050? Do we even have the knowledge that's needed to meet these and other sustainability goals? I think no one would disagree that academic institutions have a crucial role in providing the knowledge that is needed for societies to progress towards sustainability. But to fulfill this role, there must be big changes in how we do research and in how we train our students. The, the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences established the Sustainability Research Initiative to strengthen and support the research community engaged in sustainability research in Switzerland. One of its major milestones was to identify those areas where research is most urgently needed. These were recently published in a white paper that we'll talk about some more, priority themes for Swiss sustainability research. The, the priority themes are intended as an inspiration and guide for researchers, academic leaders, and research funders. Now, what were the criteria for selecting particular themes? First of all, they, uh, they need to be themes which are societally relevant, and very often they are going to require fundamental social change. They are focused upon the social, political, economic, technological levers for transformation. They're supposed to help society make the changes which are needed. Obviously, they're topics which have a particular relevance for Switzerland or for which Switzerland has a particular responsibility or leverage internationally. 
And by their nature, they lie at the interface of several SDGs and address problems in a larger context so that they require interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaboration. Most important, the purpose of the proposed research is to support practical actions towards sustainability. And you could say that the key word justifying all of these priority themes is transformation. Now the priority themes were identified and developed in a transdisciplinary process that is summarized on the next slide. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, no, could you um, click on, please? One more. So the transdisciplinary process, this is really a bottom-up attempt to find out what do stakeholders and researchers in Switzerland believe are the most important areas where research is needed. And we began uh, in 2019 with three workshops. We brought together as many experts from politics, public administration, business, NGOs, and academia as we could. And in three workshops with about 120 experts, we discussed where are the big gaps in research where knowledge is needed to make progress towards sustainability. And with a huge number of ideas, we tried to consolidate them in a workshop that we held in December 20, um, 2019, where we tried to crystallize out of all of these a number of priority topics. Out of that discussion, we came up with five main topics. And then beginning in 2020, we set up working groups, um, experts, to develop a white paper on each one of these topics. And these came together to the, the final document. But before that, it was subject to an international review. We had uh, 12 experts and many other interested stakeholders discussing whether these really were the five most important themes for Switzerland. And then the white paper was published in December. And in, in the next slide, uh, you can see this, uh, you can see this document, Priority Themes for Swiss Sustainability Research. And if you're interested, then you can download it from this, this website. That, of course, is not the end of the process. This represents a consensus document about what is important in Swiss sustainability research. And you may be interested to see what were the five themes that we believe to be most important. And on the next slide, you can see these. Uh, so for Switzerland, it was clear that food was important, the food system, food production that doesn't damage the environment and yet is nutritious and meets the requirements of people. How can we transform our food system to make it truly sustainable? The second topic we called thriving spaces, sustainability and spatial development. Now in a country like Switzerland, land is under extreme pressure. How can we compete, um, reconcile the competing claims for land while protecting our natural life support systems? Topic number three, net zero greenhouse gas emission society. Switzerland has committed to becoming net zero carbon emissions by 2050, and uh, it is still far from certain how that can be achieved. What would be a politically and social, socially feasible strategy for reaching net zero by 2050. Uh, the next one is economic and financial systems for well-being. It's clear that our economic systems have an immense impact upon how we use the environment and are currently not sustainable. How can we transform the current economic paradigm into one that serves sustainable development? And finally, we, we, we realized that so many of these sustainability questions at root were about society and society's people's visions about what is a good life and what is important for sustainability. So the, the, the final project, Shared Values, Visions and Pathways for Sustainability, is how can society develop a shared vision of a sustainable future and a strategy for achieving it? So those were the five themes that came out of this process that I've described to you. But obviously, 
all of these topics are interrelated. For example, the, fin in the finance sector has an enormous influence upon housing and spatial development. And how we do agriculture, agricultural practice, has a very big effect on greenhouse gas emissions. And very important in uh, tackling sustainability research, it's important that we don't create new silos. Indeed, you could argue that the core of the sustainability challenge is how we man manage the interrelationships between different areas of sustainability concern. So for this reason, we created a sixth priority theme, which we call synergies, trade-offs, and common threads. And that is, and this is based upon three propositions. First of all, sustainable development requires addressing many equally important goals in parallel. Secondly, synergies and trade-offs amongst these goals are inevitable. And thirdly, managing these interdependencies poses a huge challenge for public administrations. So the third topic really explores what perhaps is the core of the sustainability challenge. How do we bring all of these competing problems and interests together to come to obtain a desirable outcome? Now, my final slide is what happens next. We've launched this document. It's been very well received. Um, but it's really just the beginning of the process. As I said, it's supposed to be an inspiration to the research community. So what are we going to do next? We're going to continue to set the agenda. We're going to take these priority themes and make them more concrete, develop, develop them into areas of fundable research, which we will do in collaboration with experts and societal actors. And we hope they will spin off into active research. And we're also going to track changing research needs and, as necessary, develop new themes. Secondly, it's clear that the academic system as currently organized is not very well positioned to take this kind of problem-oriented transdisciplinary research. So we want to do what we can to improve the enabling environment. And Gabriella is going to say a little bit more about that after I finish speaking. But one of the things we're going to do is to commun communicate these priority themes as widely as possible. We plan a sort of tour de Suisse of all the Swiss universities to explain and discuss with them the need for transdisciplinary research and the opportunities for collaboration. And we'll also work with the media to get across the idea of the importance of sustainability research. And secondly, it's very important that we train the people who will be involved in this research and therefore we need to promote training in sustainability research in academic institutions. And thirdly, nothing's going to happen without funding and so we are exploring the opportunities for funding for sustainability research and we are establishing a dialogue for research funders and potential partners outside academia. So that an outline was the um, priority themes for sustainability research. Do download it and have a look at it. I think you'll find it an interesting document and it might be a useful model um, in your own country. And now I'd like to hand back to Gabriella. Thank you so much, Peter. I'll continue our uh, short presentation uh, by saying a few words on our last chapter of this report called Enabling Environment for Sustainability Research. So if we aim at uh, turning the work of key on our key sustainability issues that we identified into vibrant areas of research, we also need to look at how we do research and how we can do research and how we train our students. So what the framing conditions are for this type of research. And we identified a special need to particularly support uh, transformative research and transdisciplinary research. Um, that's why we focused on our, our last chapter on, on that kind of research. Um, this last chapter lists a few areas that are important for strengthening the institutional enabling environment um, with a focus on transdisciplinary sustainability research. So ways for creating such an enabling environment um, include 
uh, first of all, developing incentive systems that encourage researchers to get involved in such research and increase recognition of for teamwork. Second, building partnerships with non-academic stakeholders. Third, strengthening science policy dialogue. Uh, fourth, setting up novel institutional structures to foster collaboration across organizational boundaries that still exist. Then next, strengthening funding opportunities and further developing evaluation procedures for transdisciplinary sustainability research. And last but not least, introducing training programs on all levels to develop the skills needed for sustainability research. In the following, sorry for the break. In the following, uh, we will elaborate now a little more on this. And we would also like to dedicate the rest of this session on this issue. Um, so we will especially focus on capacity building in transdisciplinary research. And for giving a, a overview of that, I would like to hand over now to my colleague, Teres Paulsen. Please, Teres. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gabriela and Peter. And um, I also want to welcome you very warmly and share a few thoughts in general about the need for purposeful capacity building for transdisciplinary research, and then present a concrete introductory course to transdisciplinarity. That any university could easily include in its curriculum, because I think there is uh, still a vacuum how we can really um, build this, this capacity about these uh, questions. But even more, I'm look, looking forward to our colleagues' presentations, uh, Christian and Anne, and, I li and a lively discussion with all of you to in today's session. TDNet is, for those who are not yet familiar, familiar with our work, a network that brings together scholars um, on the nationally, but especially also on an internationally uh, level, who are thinking about these issues and trying to anchor in transdisciplinarity in higher education and research institutions. In terms of organization, we are like the, the SRI where uh, Gabriela and Peter is working on, a working group under the umbrella of the Swiss academies, doing neither research nor teaching ourselves, but providing support wherever researchers, lecturers, learners, or even funding agencies need help. We give a second home to those who, in addition to their specialist community, would also like to exchange views on the necessary cross-cutting issues, in particular in methods, processes, or strategies required for dealing with complex questions. For these, we are building up an own, but very open and uh, inclusive community. Recommendations of the OECD working group are directed to five, five um, key actors and stakeholders in the um, research in the, in the political environment. And we will see that capacity building is addressed in almost all, all of these levels. This is based on the experience that necessary competencies are not suff sufficiently available on, and that all too often everyone has to reinvent the wheel. By the way, these ideas aren't very new. I remind you that 50 years ago, Janj and Piaget were also discussing these issues. And briefly, I will show you what can be found on the OECD policy brief. So in this um, working group of the OECD, um, they brought together um, um, case studies from a several range of countries, and they addressed these key actors. 
And on the university level, you see there's uh, a whole range of, of um, recommendations they get and uh, to support early career researchers to engage and to introduce TD uh, learning modules to science education and postgraduate training courses. Research funders are a key um, actors, and they also have to support capacity building and the participation of non-academic stakeholders. Then the academic uh, community is addressed because they have to, uh, to do a peer review and evaluation processes. And these they only can do in a, in a good way when they are also trained to, to, to deal with these kind of questions. And they also have to support early career researchers to wish, uh, that wish to engage in TDR. Intergovernmental organizations are also a very important player and they have to foster, foster capacity building as well. And uh, last but not least, governments, they have uh, this uh, political broader view. I will share in the chat the, um, the link to this report of the OECD um, working group, and you can have a look at these recommendations. And now, as we saw that, that uh, capacity building is a very um, uh, important thing and that uh, courses aren't so re regularly um, uh, taught at the universities, we in our function of a network were bringing together educators from different universities in Switzerland and designed a joint course. The idea of uh, packing all the content of, uh, of inter- and transdisciplinarity in a massive open online course um, has convincing advantages. First, an international audience of more or less young researchers can be educated at the same time. Secondly, an exchange of, uh, from peer to peer is possible, which supports uh, mutual learning. So it's not only a course between a trainer and a lecturer and um, a, a room full of students, but the students um, from all over the globe are, have the possibilities to chat and to exchange their experiences and their thoughts on the problematics. Um, and this very complete course can be offered to all students of a university as a complementary subject and credits can be awarded at their own decision. So our idea was that every student at a university um, ne with a, um, without any importance in which um, faculty he's studying can have a look at these processes and uh, guiding questions and phases of transdisciplinary projects. And this is very important to, to tackle these um, sustainability um, research questions because we have people from law and uh, and environmental scientists and biologists and all these uh, different faculties that can come together so if you need some uh, information about the course or the possibilities to integrate this um, this offer into your curriculum we are very welcome to get in touch with us thank you very much and i hand over to gabriela Thank you, Therese. Wonderful. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing the slides. Um, so we would now like to open the floor to our two guests. So we invited two experts to discuss these questions in more detail. And we are very happy they, that they agreed to contribute their knowledge and experience to our session. Um, first, I am very pleased to introduce Anne Zimmermann to you. So Anne is a senior research scientist at the Center for Development and Environment, CDE, at the University of Bern. She holds a doctorate in English languages and literatures. She joined CDE in 1999 and has focused on issues related to integrating sustainable development into research and teaching ever since. 
Currently, Anne is a member of a small team that is supporting the Vice Rectorate's, uh, quality, Vice Rectorate of Qualities efforts to mainstream sustainable development in teaching at all faculties at the university. She is also involved in researching and publishing on transformative learning and science for sustainable development. Furthermore, Anne is president of the Copernicus Alliance. She has a long-term experience of teaching inter- and transdisciplinary research skills in a North-South context and is committed to supporting young researcher skills through offering scientific writing courses. She also coordinated efforts to support young women's careers as well as mainstream gender in research. Anne, may I ask you to share your uh, introductory thoughts on the potential of transformative learning with us, please. Thank you for this introduction, Gabriella, and thank you for inviting me to join your session at uh, this ISCN conference, which uh, I think is fantastic because um, it is really picking up a, a very important theme, which is about uh, how to uh, enable um, students to become transformers, basically, change agents, uh, among others. And this is the core also of something that uh, we absolutely need for trans, uh, transdisciplinary um, and, and sustainability science. Um, what you insisted on, uh, Therese, with the, the reference to the OECD report and, and recommendations is one of the things that is really important is the importance of networking. Um, and in fact, I'd like to be more precise here and say in, in networking in the sense of true partnerships, um, where uh, the common goal is more important than competition between the different members of the network. And uh, I guess this is absolutely crucial also for sustainable development. Um, so it's, it's true in several uh, senses. And um, this, is, this is what the Copernicus Alliance is um, about, really. It's, uh, it's a very active uh, community of members who are, who, who are dedicated to sustainable development and want to make sure that uh, sustainable development is, becomes the guiding principle of their higher education institutions. And collaboration between the sciences and with academic stakeholders is also key to the Copernicus Alliance. Um, we focus on, uh, on education for sustainable development in the sense defined by UNESCO in its ESD for 2030 uh, roadmap and uh, on transformation as defined in Agenda 2030 at the beginning of uh, Agenda 2030, where, um, where the text explicitly says that without transformation and transformational skills, uh, we will not be able to get there as as, uh, as, as a common, um, uh, you know, as, as humanity. Um, so the Copernicus Alliance is interested in transformative learning and science and uh, is doing research on this and uh, asks also, how does it contribute to the SDGs? So we have a research uh, focus. What competences are needed for this? This is another question that we're asking ourselves and we're focusing on the importance of student-centered learning and on not only knowledge about uh, the SDGs, but also how to get there um, and, uh, and what, what values are involved in this and how to integrate the values. And uh, we also focus on the importance of context and the perception of other stakeholders' perspectives as absolutely key to, um, to move towards uh, better skills, um, towards sustainable development. And a further uh, focus that we have is uh, on the importance of leadership skills, um, leadership skills in the sense of enhanced leadership skills or reflective leadership, leadership that goes beyond um, being me and I am pulling the cart uh, towards being together and, um, and pulling the cart together. And uh, I think this speaks very much to Peter's um, focus on the, on the, on the most uh, difficult challenge which is to manage interdependencies. I think this really uh, requires the leadership skills that I'm talking about here. 
Um, and uh, finally, the partnership principle is very important and also lifelong learning. So all of these aspects actually make it very coherent with the transdisciplinarity effort that, uh, that uh, TDNet is um, and the Swiss academies are uh, representing and the kind of research that is, um, has just been outlined by all of you. Um, we also realized in our network that the rules and environment for enabling this kind of um, approach is essential. And that's why we decided to focus in our, uh, in our recent um, uh, conference, the Higher Education Summit 2020, uh, also on quality assurance. And we decided to bring together different communities um, uh, to break the barriers between the silos, also the, the sectorial silos within academia, not just the disciplines, but between, for example, quality assurance um, people, uh, societal stakeholders, um, uh, people in, 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 uh, in important positions like rectors and vice rectors, and researchers and uh, uh, societal stakeholders. So that was uh, what we tried to do in, in the HES 2020, in the Higher Education Summit. And uh, we focused also on the definition of transformative learning and quality assurance and tried to see also how practices actually um, lead to more um, sustainable development and how to push this in higher education. Uh, I'd like to just complete this, so, this um, brief summary of what, uh, what we did here with um, the, the uh, remark that it was a wonderful opportunity to organize uh, this um, higher education summit because we were able to do it um, between three networks and two universities. And this is where we realized how important it is actually to enact also this breaking of bar barriers. Um, the Copernicus Alliance worked with TDNet and SAGOF and the University of Bern, which was the host of the conference, worked together with the University of Lausanne. Now, let me come to um, the, uh, your question, uh, Gabriella. What is transformative learning? Uh, in, put it, to put it very bluntly, transformative learning is learning that is transformative for the learner and the learners, and that enables one to become a transformer or to become a change agent. It is both at the same time. And it is absolutely crucial in the context of transdisciplinary research to know and to know what this is and, and to be able to do it. And to be able to do it in the context of um, sustainable, uh, sorry, of higher education is quite delicate and difficult because uh, there are uh, inherent challenges that, um, that need to be dealt with. Um, what is transformative learning? It's the move from a stable and comfortable um, state where you are comfortable about the up to now and old meanings and perspectives and being are, you know, sort of frame what you are, what you do and what you feel and how a community works together. Um, and the, you have to be led into a liminal state or lead yourself into a limited state, liminal state where things become fluid and discomfort uh, emerges. And um, you are in a state of in-between, either as an individual or as a community. Um, state A is no longer uh, there and there is, you don't know yet what state B is going to be like. You lose your, um, your perspective and, uh, and, and you become very self-reflective as well. And finally, when you integrate new elements, you move into a stable and comfortable uh, position again. Uh, the new also means new meaning, new perspectives, new being, and uh, new acting, of course, as well. Um, this requires that uh, you need a trigger, a trigger that will trigger edge emotions and a, a so-called learning edge. This has to take place in, within a safe space because if, it, if the space is not safe uh, for this to happen, um, students and, 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 and people in general will feel very insecure and might be, feel threatened and fall back into the original state. Um, where uh, they are back with their old, um, old habits and old perspectives. 
Um, so if we can if we can move people beyond that into uh, into the safe space and uh, and and the sense of feeling safe, they will develop tremendous creativity, and they will develop critical reflection. And also, uh, eventually, if if they are led properly to, into this um, in, into this, also um, the leadership skills that they will need uh, to to be able to uh, link this with sustainable development. The um, Saguf uh, had, a, had a, a meeting where they actually um, went through eight propositions uh, for transformative learning and teaching. They sort of, we, we carved out what, what were the challenges that needed to be addressed by higher education um, to ensure that transformative learning and teaching might be possible. And the first one, uh, the first, uh, proposition that we have is that in fact higher education has fundamental potential for transformative learning and teaching there's no reason why it should not be possible um, but and uh, in addition um, sustainability requires value-oriented transformative learning and teaching and this sustainable sustainability orientation is also um, uh, in need of reflexive in an uh, examination of normativity, which is not something that is simple to do at, uh, at, in higher education. Um, and uh, emotions require targeted attention as well in sustainability oriented teaching and learning. Um, this is particularly difficult. Both normativity and emotionality constitute huge challenges for science-based university teaching, which does not mean that it is impossible to meet them. And uh, as, as I said before, it's necessary to constitute safe teaching and learning arrangements to facilitate uh, these transformative learning um, processes. And it's necessary to professionalize sustainability oriented transformative learning and teaching. As uh, Therese also mentioned, it's really important, and um, Peter as well, it's really important to train the uh, people who will be teaching how to do that kind of research um, in, and clarify relations with uh, established university pedagogy. Our final proposition is that further research on sustainability oriented transformative le uh, learning and teaching in higher education is needed. And perhaps the solution would be to do that within the framework also of the transdisciplinarity and sustainability um, research uh, efforts that uh, you are doing now at the, um, uh, at the TDNet of the Swiss academies. So thanks a lot. And I hope this is a way of handing over to Christian. Yes, it's me in between first. Thank you very much, Anne. That was extremely interesting and gave a very, very good overview. And I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss um, later with our audience. Um, but before we do that, um, I would like to pass on the word to, to Christian Paul and also briefly tell you who he is. So Christian is a senior scientist and co-director of the Transdisciplinarity Lab, TD Lab of the Department of Environmental System Science at ETH Zurich. He is uh, working on building a body of knowledge of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research, and more specifically, the question of how to conceptualize and practice such collaborative research. Since the late 1990s and together with colleagues from around the world, he has developed, for instance, the, um, the publication, the, the, the little book Principles for Designing Transdisciplinary Research. He has contributed to the Handbook of Transdisciplinary Research together with Gertrude Hirschhardon and others. And he developed the TDNet's toolbox for co-producing knowledge as its founding editor. He is also a founding member of the editorial board for the Team Science Toolkit of the US National Cancer Institute. Furthermore, he is a member of the steering committee of the Sustainability Research Initiative. Um, and the scientific, he's also a member of the scientific advisory board of TDNet of the Swiss Academies. So Christian, we are very happy to have you here. And because uh, before I, I let you speak, I will show your short video and afterwards uh, you can then directly uh, take over. Okay.
Wir untersuchen das Wassermanagement im Oberengadin, speziell in Bezug auf den Klimawandel. Im ersten Semester analysieren die Studierenden einen Teilaspekt des Themas. Sie lernen in Gruppen zusammenzuarbeiten und eine gegebene Fragestellung durch eigene Recherchen in einem wissenschaftlichen Bericht zu beantworten. Am Ende des ersten Semesters stellen die Studentinnen mit Präsentationen und Rollenspielen ihre Erkenntnisse vor Stakeholdern vor. In der Synthesewoche werden die Gruppen neu zusammengesetzt. Nun ist jeder Student und jede Studentin Expertin des im ersten Semester bearbeiteten Teilaspekts. Die Studierenden lernen den Blick aufs Ganze, das Systemdenken und das Fokussieren auf spezifische Probleme und mögliche Maßnahmen, das Designdenken, miteinander zu verbinden. Diese Woche wird von den Tutorierenden geleitet. Am Ende der Synthesewoche stellen die Studierenden die von ihnen identifizierten Probleme, Maßnahmen und Prototypen vor. Im zweiten Semester arbeiten die Gruppen ein konkretes Nachhaltigkeitsprojekt aus. Aufgrund der Rückmeldungen der drei bis vier wichtigsten Stakeholder überarbeiten sie ihre Maßnahmen laufend. Am Ende des Semesters werden die Projekte am Markt der Maßnahmen vorgestellt. Die Studierenden können ihr Nachhaltigkeitsprojekt im fakultativen Umweltproblemlösen 3 umsetzen. UPL 3 wurde auf Wunsch der Studierenden eingeführt. Thank you, Gabriela. And all, uh, thank you to all of you for the kind introduction and uh, that I can say a few words about UPL Umwelt Problem. I can say a few words about Umwelt Problem. And I try to link uh, in two or three minutes to what was said before. So, for instance, the course Umwelt Problem I mean, it's part of the Bachelor Umwelt Naturwissenschaften. So it's mostly environmental science students. I mean, it's like um, the students that probably later will end in jobs where they either do research for sustainable development or where they do projects for sustainable development. Um, in that course, and here I'm relating to what Thierry said before, we never use the word transdisciplinarity. That's like funny, right? Because it's the whole course is so much designed based on the principles of transdisciplinarity. But if we don't use the words, this might come later in their education, because here we really want to focus them on how can they learn to analyze and solve complex problems. They should not think too much about complex terminologies, but about the method of how to address problems. Uh, but still, as I said, it's completely designed on all the principles that transdisciplinary research comes with. Collaboration in groups, becoming a specialist, collaboration between specialists, uh, having a system you dealing with uh, with uh, emotions, with norms, uh, collaborating with stakeholders, all included, but we don't use the word. The second I try to relate to to Anne and the transformative learning. I think we uh, we do quite a lot of what could be called transformative learning. Um, we do that quite a bit by throwing students into the cold water without without giving them too much instructions beforehand. <laughs> what basically gives a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> and then we, we uh, uh, teach a lot according to the principle of fail forward. So we give explanations only uh, half a year later or so. For instance, from the beginning on, they have to collaborate in group groups. They have to write a, a weekly journal of how they address problems in collaborating. And only after like eight weeks or so, we give them an input about what collaboration group means, what the different phases are, what the different characters are, and then they start to reflect on what they did before. 
And with the relation to research for sustainable development, what Peter and Gabriela said at the beginning in the transformations, I mean, as I said, um, this is the bachelor, only the minor part of these students will end as researchers. Most of them will end in jobs and hopefully using the knowledge they have about how to address complex problems in their jobs. For the others that end in research for sustainable development, my hope is that we can at least put a little, um, little bit of thoughts and concepts into their minds of how to address complex problems, of how to work outside the ivory tower, of how to connect uh, research and practical problem solving, and that they keep that little seed <laughs> corn in their brains on the long way of becoming more and more of a disciplinary scientist. I also, this is my last one, I also think uh, what a surprise for me was that um, it makes this course in the first year of the bachelor makes students aware of how important research and knowledge of different disciplines is. So for instance, the professor of law who teaches law in the first semester also would come to us after two years of Umwelt Problem Lösen and he would say, oh, it's so great. Now, finally, the students come to my course and they want to know more about law because some of the students uh, apparently develop projects where they have to change the law, right? And so they have to know how this law works. And I also think one of the problems they can identify in the second semester is that there is knowledge is needed. And then the answer that they have to come up with is, oh, we have to do research. So for instance, one of the groups in this project in the Oberengadin, they realized that nobody in the Oberengadin knows about uh, microplastics in rivers. There are just no data. And so they do now a bachelor thesis where they, together with other uh, universities and ETH, um, test and identify the, the whether there are microplastics in the in-river or not in the, in the Oberengadin. So with that, I want to close and I hand over to Gabriela again. Thank you, Christian, for this, uh, for sharing with us this interesting case study course that you are offering. And we look forward to hear more in our live Q&A session that will start soon. Thank you very much.